Hey, you guys, this is the Scripture Study Project. We are dedicated to helping you discover the scriptures in a fresh way, invest your mind and heart into your personal study, and connect to God in your everyday life. We are excited to be with you today. Um, we're going to be studying in 1 Nephi 8 through 10. And today we have a special treat for you because we have special guests with us today. Um, it's Zach and Katie Cowan of Study Daily. And they are going to teach us today and be with us today. And um, we're going to get to hear from them on their story. And we're just excited because one of the things that we really wanted to do this year is um, get other people's voices out there as well, because there's so many people doing so much good. And we're excited to start with Zach and Katie today. So first, a big welcome to you, Zach and Katie. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. Um, well, let's get started. Maybe some personal, like your family, what you do, um, and tell us a little bit about how you got started with um, your product, and even tell a little about it because I didn't do a good job of setting up what that what your what your books are. Um, but we would love to hear more um, about you guys before we start. So we're Zach and Katie Cowan. Uh, we live in Salina, Utah, which is the middle of nowhere. Don't even try to find it. Um, <laughs> we've got four boys. And it's just as wild as it sounds, but we run the Study Daily Instagram account. And uh, Zach has also written the Study Daily books. We've got them for each of the standard works. And yeah, Zach, do you want to say anything about the books? No, they just break up each book into 365 days with questions. Rather than it being a book where you're, you're, told what to find. It's really a book that helps you guide things and to find application for your own life and meaning. I love that. I I really think that what you guys do is so great that it um, is just that way of getting people into the scriptures on a daily basis. You guys have been doing this from the beginning of like knowing that it's important just to make that connection to God every day and using those questions I think is so powerful. Um, yeah. How did you guys get started into into doing that? What made, what was the inspiration behind your, your books? Cause they've been out for a few years now. And obviously you have all four, you go through all four books of scripture. So I would love to hear more of that creation process for you. Yeah. So we really just kind of stumbled into it. I uh, didn't really intend on writing books. I had kind of gotten the feeling uh, after elder Bednar did his share goodness uh presentation. And I thought, you know, what can we do to share goodness? And so we, I said, let's start an Instagram account. That's kind of like a book club, but with the scriptures. And so Zach would, um, we started on January 1st and Zach wrote, um, just kind of a prompt to start out the year of studying the scriptures. And I would post it every day. And so we did that for three years, <laughs> posting for three everything. years through all the books. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's, and, that's really cool. And I didn't know this until we were talking with you guys, but like your Instagram account, I was just scrolling down through it. You have like 1200 posts and each yeah. of them is just a comment and a question daily through each block of scripture. So if anyone out there is listening and you haven't gone to their Instagram account, it's it's all there. Like it's all there. Thousands yeah. of stuff uh, of pages or of, of posts there, which is really cool. Yeah. So if you don't want to buy a book because you're cheap, you can just scroll down. <laughs> that's that's we like the content being on there. It's on there for completely free, and you can always scroll down and find it. It really it would cool. be it would be much easier to buy the books though. <laughs> <laughs> It would be worth the $15 to buy the book so that you can just have it right there in mm -hmm. front of you. Well, thank you for what you're doing. I think that's really cool to hear kind of the beginnings of um, probably something that God put in your heart to spread to spread that goodness out. So we're grateful to have your insights today and that we get to study with you in some really great chapters, right? As we move in through 1 Nephi, um, in 1 Nephi 8 through 10. So mm -hmm. We're excited to have you guys here and grateful that you're here. We're so excited to be here. So as we were looking um, at this block, 1 Nephi 8 through 10, of course, it's one of the more, if not most famous blocks in the Book of Mormon. It's the vision of the tree of life. And as I was looking at it, I was kind of struck there's, there's two visions in these blocks. And 
We traditionally focus on the first one in chapter 8, but there's also a second one in chapter 10. Um, the first vision in chapter 8 that Lehi has is the vision of the tree of life, and uh, we're probably all familiar at least with the imagery that's there. Um, one of the things that we um, pointed out two years ago when we did this episode was um, there's, of course, symbolism behind just about everything in the vision, uh, and maybe even multiple symbolic meanings behind different things. But of course, the most important symbol to understand and get right is that tree at the center of the vision, which represents, uh, well, the fruit of the tree, which represents the love of God. Um, Lehi makes it very clear in chapter 10, this is the second vision, if you will, that his focus in that vision um, is, this is verse four, um, even a Messiah, a savior of the world, verse five, a redeemer of the world. That's the whole focus of the vision is how do we get to this tree and eat this fruit, which represents the son of God and his sacrifice and love for us. Um, and so it's, it's beautiful in its simplicity. The image I like the most, and I think this is what I'd like to start with to ask you guys some questions, um, is in First Nephi chapter eight, there's multiple groups that that Lehi observes. There's some that um, wander into the great and spacious building. There's some that walk along the straight and narrow path, but then their walk gets obscured by the mist of darkness and they wander off. Uh, there's a group that makes it to the tree, eats the fruit, but then because of the pointing and mocking of the group in the, in the great and spacious building, they walk away ashamed. But then there's this final group. Um, and I love this verse, verse 30. Nephi is narrating, he says, to be short in writing, behold, he, Lehi, saw other multitudes pressing forward, and they came and caught hold of the end of the rod of iron, and they did press their way forward, continually holding fast to the rod of iron until they came forth and fell down and partook of the fruit of the tree. And that image of them falling down at the tree, at this symbolic representation of the Savior, that's the image that always captivates my attention. And I want to know, what do I what is it about the Savior? What is it about this Redeemer and Messiah that makes me want to come to him and fall down before him, partake of the fruit, and then like Lehi does, get as many of my family members there? And so that's the question that we'd like to pose and that we uh, would love to hear your guys' thoughts on is, what do we learn about the Lord in these couple of chapters that makes us want to get to the tree and that makes us want to invite other people to come as well? That's an excellent question. Um, I love that image of them falling down. It, they're not falling down because of exhaustion. They're falling down because of admiration and love for their Redeemer. And mm -hmm. then uh, they're ready to continue the next part of their journey, which is to help other people get there. The, some of the things I absolutely love about the Savior is just his willingness to do the same thing for us that Lehi did for his family. He wants us here. And so we talked earlier just about this a little bit, but these two visions, Lehi's and Nephi's, are given for two different reasons. And I love the fact that Jesus Christ realized that Laman and Lemuel are in trouble, and he is trying to help parents uh, see that as well so that the parents can take steps to try to get these, these two struggling kids back onto the path and back towards the iron rod. So he sends a vision to Lehi so that they can realize Oh, they're in trouble. And Lehi, at the end of the chapter, he starts teaching and testifying to them, and it, it kind of consumes him. And then it even causes Nephi to want to learn more about it. But mm -hmm. God does not want to lose his kids. He wants us to come, and he beckons us to come. And I think if he was, you know, if the Savior was the one, when Lehi gets to the tree and he partakes of the fruit and he feels how good it is and he wants his family there, then with a loud voice he calls to his, his family. And I just think Jesus Christ would be calling to a loud voice to all of us to come. Just come be with me. Come feel what I am and bring your family. Bring your family. I don't want just you. I want your family as well. And that's a, that's a being worth falling down and worshiping, that he's not satisfied with one person. He wants many people to be blessed. And Zach, I'm going to quote you, Zach Cowan. <laughs> Did you guys catch that? That 
both <laughs> we have two Zachs on our on our episode today. So hopefully you don't get confused, but I think their voices are different enough that <laughs> you'll be able to tell. But I'm going to quote Zach Cowan here as we were kind of going through the episode together earlier. Something that you said was um, that God cares about his people. And you brought this up that this vision is proof that um, God wants to save everyone. And you were kind of talking about that too, but that Laman and Lemuel, he's giving this vision, this really beautiful and and deep vision to someone so that he can save everyone. That's who God is. He he reaches out to everyone and wants, does everything he can to save them. I even love um, the line in verse 37. Lehi exhorts them as children, Laman and Lemuel specifically, with all the feeling of a tender parent, which of course explains how Lehi feels about Laman and Lemuel. But but based on what you're saying is an explanation for how Heavenly Father feels about us, whether we're Nephi or whether we're Laman and Lemuel or somewhere in between, uh, wants us to come to him with all the feelings of a tender parent. I, I just, I like that phrase a lot. Yeah. And I like that in this vision, he hasn't just given us a couple of things to get us to the tree. He's given us several things because uh, we've got, we know the iron rod comes, but when Lehi first gets to it, he's directed by an angel. He's there by personal revelation that he gets there. And then after he gets there uh, in verse 15, it came to pass that I beckoned unto them when he sees his family and also I did say unto them with a loud voice that they should come unto me and partake of the fruit, which was desirable above all other fruit. And so God has also given us parents to help get us to Jesus Christ. Parents who first came to the Savior have felt of his love, have partaken of the fruit of the atonement. And then they turn around and they say, you know what? Come and feel, come enjoy what I have felt. Come have a, a different experience in this world of being lost and alone and come be with your family and feel love and joy and peace. And that's what the Savior's offering. And then Lehi, it's double amplified that he's also the prophet. And God also has given us prophets to help guide us there. And then in, in, with all of that, he puts up this rod of iron to help us get there that we can cling and hold fast to. So he has put in place several things to help us get to his love and to feel of his love and to stay with him throughout the rest of our life with the people that we love and care about. It's really cool. And it, it makes me think, you know, our last, our study of First Nephi 1 through 7, one of the questions we asked was, um, how does the Lord talk to his people? And there's multiple examples there of the Lord talking, for example, to Lehi in a dream, um, talking to Nephi through Lehi's dream and through Lehi's preaching, but also talking to Lehi through his, or Nephi through his own personal revelation experiences with the Lord. And, And what you're saying is this is kind of a continuation of that same thing. Look at even more the things the Lord is trying to do to help us get there. It's not just a path. It's not just a rod. It's not just a parent. It's it's everything, whether it's an angel, whether it's the pleadings of a tender parent, whether it's uh, the, the enticings of this fruit and of this tree, he'll do whatever it takes to get us to come to him. Yeah. And I think those that are, that are listening can probably even ask themselves, which of the three has been most beneficial in helping us get to and experience the love of Jesus Christ? How have parents helped us? How was the prophet? How have they helped us? How are they helping us? Um, and how have and how is the word of God helping us? That's really cool. And I think about that of just maybe many of the different ways that I've felt that, like those come in different times and seasons. Like maybe sometimes I'm really impacted by something the prophet has said, or I've really seen the blessings from that, or, you know, from a parent or someone close to me that has given me guidance that he'll use those ways, maybe not all at once, sometimes all at once, but that he has so many different ways in which he's trying to get through to us. And if we're listening, he's there, he's there giving us direction and guidance. I think another, another great thing that, that this story gives us is this is our first experience in the scriptures where we see that even the prophet's kids (laughs) struggle. Yeah. This is a great time for us to read and study and see that, you know, it's not perfect all the time. Yeah. I think it's interesting with this, as we look at it in the framework of what you've just said, that we could ask ourselves, where am I in this vision? Where, where would my family members be at? And from what I learned in this vision, what can I do to help 
And I think it's neat that Lehi doesn't leave the tree. Lehi stays by the tree and he describes what he experiences. He encourages them to come. He looks for them. He beckons for them. He wants them to come. And when it's over, he takes action on it, that he's got to go out and do those things. And we're probably thinking of different family members that are that are not at the tree with us and some that are maybe just starting to cling and we're hoping but individually every single person has to make their choice about where they're going to, where they're going to gather to and where they're at on the path so if i can ask then a question with this theme of what do we learn about the lord that makes us want to come to him zach you pointed something out um as we were talking before we were recording that the neat thing about this vision is it doesn't just show people coming to the tree. It does show this last group of people that stay at the tree. So as I mentioned before, there's of course one group, uh, this is chapter eight, verse 28, that after they had tasted the fruit, they're ashamed because of those that were scoffing at them and they fell away into forbidden paths and were lost. But then in verse 30, there is that group that comes and falls down and partakes of the fruit and they stay there. And there's a difference. Both groups make it to the tree, but there is a group that stays there. And I know one of the questions that I had as I was studying, but also a question that I've heard from parents and priesthood leaders um, is, is there a way to help myself stay at the tree? I have a lot of teenagers that'll ask that, that they see family members leaving and there's this fear of what if it happens to me? I don't want it to happen to me, but my brother who served a mission and now is home from his mission and has left the church, he didn't want it to happen, but it's he left the church. Is there a way that I can stay at the tree? And is there a way that I can help those that I love and care about stay at the tree? So with that, I wonder if you had any, you, you brought that up before. I wonder if you have any thoughts from this, from these scriptures on anything that might help people stay at the tree or want to stay at the tree. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a couple of things that I see that those in the scriptures in this block do that I think I've seen people in real life do that help them stay at the tree. One of the first things is when Lehi eats of this fruit and it makes him happy and he describes it and he has such a good experience and then he desires to share it with others. I think sometimes we're not really good. We feel good, but maybe we don't go into detail of really describing the delight we have of what we get in the gospel and taking time to express the things we love. Sometimes we have testimony of everything, but we don't, or we say we have a testimony of everything, but not real specific. But if we take different portions of the gospel, like reading scriptures, saying prayers, and we try to specifically articulate in the way, in what ways those have blessed our life and delight in them. Because one of the reasons people fell away is they were ashamed when people mocked them. So rather than being ashamed, maybe we could better do do a better job of promoting what we delight in, in the gospel. I love coming to church and sitting around people that are my neighbors and that sometimes we don't even get along with and it, it forces us to love them and care about them and be involved with them. And when they have hardships to mourn with them and pray for them, and it broadens my feelings beyond my own personal life and to realize that I'm not alone and that I can do a better job in the world. And so we could talk about that for every aspect of the gospel and maybe do a better job of promoting it like Lehi does, of really describing the whiteness of that fruit and the joy that we feel from that aspect of the gospel. I think that's one thing. And then right after that, Lehi goes forth and he immediately starts to tell others. I have a brother-in-law who's really good at this, that he gets into gospel conversations all over the place really easy. And when we were talking about it, he said, sharing the gospel is as easy as recommending a movie or a restaurant. It's so natural to share the things we love. If we, we watch a show on Netflix and we binge watch it, we're going to tell people about it. And he said, so if you really like fasting, you would talk about it. If you really like the feeling you get of temple work and work for the dead, it's natural to talk about it and to invite others to participate and come and try that, just like we would do with a restaurant or a good movie. And then this last one in verse 33, that there's a group that enters into a, a strange building and they start to point the finger of scorn at me and at those who are partaking of the fruit also. 
but we heeded them not. These are the words of my father, for as many as heeded them had fallen away. It's sometimes really hard not to not to have a hard time when somebody starts to tease us and mock us. And this is such a big deal that it's one of the major things the Savior in his, with the Beatitudes, he ends with saying, blessed are those who are persecuted. He warns people are going to tease you when you start talking about how good the gospel makes you feel and how repentance changes you and brings joy and that listening to a prophet motivates you to want to go home and to be better in your family relationships. People will mock that and they'll tease it. The hard thing is to remember is that those who are teasing sometimes aren't at the tree. And it's been a long time since they've partaken of the fruit. And we can remember what that's like. So I think those are three things that might help. And you can you can probably do a much better job talking about things than me, but there's <laughs> there's some ideas. No, that's so good. And I love I love pointing out those two points as balancing principles. One, that um talking about the way that the fruit quote unquote makes us feel the experience it gives us is needed um i think i've said in previous episodes but we we sometimes suffer from an i know testimony culture which is we think that the only way to share a testimony is to talk about what we know but there's a whole array of different ways to describe our relationship with God from I feel or I enjoy or I find peace with or this makes me happy that can allow us, like you say, to talk about the experience with the fruit. But then the companion principle of that is um, if you're going to be talking about that, those that even that haven't tasted of the fruit or haven't tasted in a while are going to mock and there has to be that resilience to not heat them. And so I, I like both of those balancing principles. Well, I, I think that example that you gave of your brother-in-law who, I mean, really comparing it to other things that you love, how quick are we to say, where did you get that sweater? I'm speaking girl language. You talked about <laughs> the movies and <laughs> where'd you get that sweater? I got it at the DI. <laughs> <laughs> but like that, that idea of really making it so, so natural, if it's really something and, you know, I, you just can't help but feel Nephi or Lehi's love for that fruit. And like you described in those verses, like it was, like you said, it was white. It filled my soul with exceedingly great joy. And I began to desire, desire that my family partake also. I think we have a lot of those things in our lives and it is so easy to share our favorite movie or our favorite pair of jeans or shoes or whatever. But um, if we really look at it, like the way that Lehi is, that it brings us joy. And just because we like to share things. That's all, all what social media is about. We're going to share things because it makes us happy. And I think um, we all have a desire to do that. Um, and if we can just make it a little more natural and realize that it is natural mm -hmm. to share something that we love. I think another interesting thing to point out is they were clearly, um, they had a hard time with the way that other people felt about them. They were looking outward rather than looking inward and looking upward. You know, it says um, the people in the, in the building, they were in the attitude of mocking and pointing their fingers towards those who had come at and were partaking of the fruit. So those who were partaking of the fruit, they, they were um, insecure with, with where they were personally and rather than looking inward and looking upward, they were looking outward. And that, <laughs> that never works. And I love what Zach Cowan pointed out earlier too, about, I never thought of that, that Lehi stays. He stays at the tree because you know that his source, like you're saying, Katie, is that he is the source that he's looking up. He's not concerned about, all he's concerned about is doing what God wants him to do and then sharing it with the people he cares about. He's staying at the tree because he is not even paying attention to what other people are doing. And that, that can be a challenge for all of us, but I think that example is really cool to think about. I think it was uh, my seminary teacher that pointed out the difference in verse 24 with the first group that falls away, that they were clinging to the rod. And then in verse 30, the second group that stays at the tree, that they continually hold fast to the rod. And it may be a stretch, but... Um, the image of clinging to something out of fear. They're looking sideways at the great and spacious building. They're terrified of what's happening over there. So even when they come to the tree, 
their focus diverts almost immediately to what's across the river. Whereas the group that's continually holding fast, you have this image that their, their focus is locked on the tree. And when they get there, they don't heed what's happening in the building because it's of no concern to them. I love that. And I love that both, both places of gathering in this story, they have a prophet there asking people to come and to gather. And here's Lehi saying, come and feel this. That's going to make help you feel joy and it will bless your family. And on the other side, they're saying, don't do that. How foolish is that? Come with us. Come have a good time with us. And as we look around, there are people clamoring for our attention. But what they don't say is, hey, I'm a prophet. And I either I'm a prophet that will help you get to the tree or I'm a prophet that's going to try to lead you away from it. And as I look at President Nelson, that is a prophet that I desperately want to follow. There's something about the way he lives his life that I find almost magnetic, that since he's become the prophet, I am attracted to what he teaches in a way in which I want to follow. I know he's at the tree. I know he's partaken of the fruit. And I want to get to where he is, and I want to feel what he's felt. Well, I want to end um, with a a verse or two, and then a final question to you guys. Um, As I mentioned, there's two major revelations in this block. Uh, Chapter 8, of course, the vision of the tree of life, but then chapter 10, where Nephi or Lehi describes seeing and knowing that a Messiah will come. Um, a savior of the world, a redeemer of the world. And then this in verse six, which reminds me of the vision, uh, wherefore all mankind were in a lost and fallen state and ever would be, save they should rely on this redeemer. And that lost and fallen reminds me of the people in the vision who are lost or fallen. Among those that are in the vision, um, Nephi, of course, is the narrator and the, kind of the central focus Um, It's interesting to me that Nephi says in verse 17, after he had heard the words of his father, both the vision of the tree and his prophecies about the coming of the son of God, Nephi says, I was desirous also that I might see and hear and know of the things which my father had seen, which is what we're going to read about in the next study. But I wonder, Katie and Zach, if we can just end with you guys, what are your thoughts or final testimonies even on uh, this process of coming to see, hear, and know, and and build a relationship with the Savior. I think Nephi is, uh, in all of Scripture, I think Nephi is probably the greatest tutor we have ever had on what it means to be a spiritual learner. And if a person were to study first Nephi and look at his life, they would learn how to get revelation from God and how to be directed in any situation whatever the challenge is. And Nephi is a great a, a great witness, not only of Heavenly Father's love and Jesus Christ's ability to strengthen and to help us, but also the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost. And he promises in verse 19 that those who diligently seek shall find and the mysteries of God will be unfolded to them. And that's that's it. If we just go forward, the next step will be unfolded. And then the next step and the next step, and we will be led to the tree. The fog will lift as we cling to the word of God through the Holy Ghost, through prophets and through scriptures. And our life will continually be a delight. God delights to make our life really, really enjoyable. I love that. I love what you share. I love thinking about all that we can learn from Nephi and more about God through these visions. Um, So true. And we just are so grateful that you guys were on today. We love what you do. We love what you shared today. Our listeners, make sure to check out Study Daily. We will put links to them. Um, You can follow them on Instagram. I think your books are on Amazon too, aren't they? Yep, they're all available on Amazon. Awesome. So thank you again, Zach and Katie, for being here. We're so grateful. Um, And listeners and everyone, we hope you have a great week and a great study. Mm -hmm.